Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining us once again. We have a very special guest today. And before I announce her formally, if you are new to the channel, please do like, subscribe, and share as it helps the channel grow and others to gain the knowledge that you've been afforded. Today, we have a very special guest that I've been waiting to talk to for quite a while. Miss Ann Vandersteel has been kind enough to join us. And I'm just going to read down her bio a little bit for posterity. She is the host of Right Now, which is a recognized name in news. She is an outspoken constitutionalist. And is more than just a journalist, she's also an information war correspondent as well as an activist. Her activism includes the promotion of tactical civics and the people's operation restoration, both of whom are dedicated to educating the people on their power in respect to, with respect to common law and restoring the republic. Anne's work with patriot and medical freedom movements around the world have led her to focus on weaponizing uh, human migration such as Operation Burning Bridge, which is a collaboration with famed Green Beret war correspondent Michael Yan, he, which is exposing the forces behind the worldwide manufacturing migration, which is in fact threatening the sovereignty of America. Prior to right now, Anne was the host of Steel Truth and is considered a thought leader and trailblazer with respect to new media. Steel Truth was recognized as the premier primetime investigative news program competitive with the best of mainstream media has to offer. As a news magazine, Steel Truth was focused on topics primarily um, ignored or mischaracterized by the mainstream media, delivering hard-hitting content with a topical segmented format covering news, money, health, as well as guest expertise. Uh, Anne's reputation for being a fair investigative citizen journalist whose A-list guests and, re and sources are committed to exposing and sharing complex stories while also offering opinions and solutions. She has established her name as a serious reporter, thus attracts a very varied group of high profile guests across governmental, medical, commercial, and respective entertainment fields. With all that said, Ann Vandersteel, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, John. It's great to be with you. And I appreciate uh, you reading the whole bio. I, you know, you, you, you don't read your bio often, but it is, uh, tells you I've been doing this a little bit, maybe too long. <laughs> <laughs> Long enough to be dangerous, as they say. And as they say. <laughs> so, Ann, there's so many things that we're going to cover today, obviously, as we talked offline. But um, let's start on a very, you're very good at a lot of things. But one of the things I've always enjoyed about you is your your wide net of uh, perspective as it relates to global journalism and the whole of the bigger picture. So if you don't mind, let's start a little bit with what you talked about with Operation Bring uh, Edge and with respect to the ME conflict and what effect that's having both on the world and the U.S. as a whole. Sure. So Operation Burning Edge uh, has been a collaboration of Michael Yan and myself. And as Michael likes to say, he's a you know quite a famous uh, Green Beret war correspondent who I like to remind people has logged more hours behind enemy lines documenting war as a correspondent than anybody to date, as a matter of fact. And you know he asked me to join him back last summer to do a quick trip about a month long going along the southern border to look at everything that was happening because we you know saw this as a clear intersection of war and invasion happening of our country and uh you know burning edge uh developed into going and taking and you know essentially force multiple force multiplying our efforts with a collaboration of other journalists reporters correspondents citizen journalists etc to not only look at the southern border and that the child trafficking that was happening, but also down into Panama, into the Darien Gap and Central America, to fully understand the organizations that are behind this weaponized mass human migration. The United Nations being probably the biggest uh, organization that has been weaponized with its NGOs, its non-governmental organizations, and of course, the behemoth American taxpayer finances that are you know funding the UN with the largest funder to the United Nations and they're turning around and redirecting that money to basically turn the weapons of human mass migration on us on the American people here in our country. And so you know it, that effort has really exposed just how big the global collaboration is to the to the destruction of the sovereignty of America which has always stood in the way of a full totalitarian uh, you know tyranny around the globe. We've always, you know, stood for the bastion of freedom, but today what we're under is a uh, fake, fraudulent, phony government where the, you know, the Biden regime does not even have proper oaths of office on file. They may have some on file, but they're defective. It all started with uh, looking into why Lloyd Austin would be poisoning his military with the bioweapon. And we learned that not only did Austin, but everybody in the Biden regime does not have a proper oath filed and nor do the um 
you know, universe, uh, USA, the uh, United States attorneys, nor like Judge Boasberg, you know, people who've been behind the J6 and, you know, incarceration without habeas corpus, obviously being suspended, et cetera. So we're seeing a massive takeover. It's a global public private takeover. And it's led in part by the the hierarchy and pecking order coming out of an organization known as the Committee of 300, otherwise known as the Olympians. Uh, and these people, you know, basically control another organization known as the Royal Institute for International Affairs, which has Tavistock under its realm, as well as uh, NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And we could talk about how NATO has been weaponized to, you know, basically start World War Three, so that the international banking community can fund both sides of that, just like the intelligence community has created boogeymen in every single country. You know, CIA created ISIS and, and uh, the Israeli, the Mossad created Hamas. And again, this is always to keep the, the public of the particular countries in fear and asking for government help to protect them from these terrorists, when in fact, it's the government that are creating these terrorist organizations. Our own weaponized agencies have their guns turned on us, right? The IRS hiring 87,000 agents and arming them. Those guns aren't for the agents and as much as they are to subdue us. And, uh, you know, when people start to understand there's no law that you have to pay, you know, income tax on your personal labor, can you imagine when the American public truly understands what that means? They're going to question, why am I filing income tax? Uh, because they're afraid because someone with a gun is going to come to your door or you're going to get hauled into court, et cetera. So there's just so much weaponization of the global governments against their people, and it's gone on for centuries. And, and America has always been sort of that last nation where you thought that didn't happen. Well, we're now waking up to the fact that we never really truly won the revolution. That's been a, a ruse, and we've been under control for quite some time. And so, you know, Operation Burning Edge, exploring just the weaponization of mass migration, starts to peel back the onion, and you start to understand that inside governments, you know, there are still good people that are afraid and they see that the agencies, these non-governmental agencies specifically, are taking over, which is what the State Department has done here in this country, sending money to NGOs. And, of course, we're redirecting it through the UN to NGOs. And that's how our government is being organized. And this is who we're serving. We're not serving the people. And when the people come forward with grievances to have redressed by members of Congress, they're thrown in jail, like January 6th. So we don't have a court system. We don't have a government. We don't have an executive branch. Uh, we clearly don't have a legislative branch. And uh, what we do have is we have a corporation that's being run by a malevolent dictator named Joe Biden. And previous to that, we had a corporation being run by a benevolent dictator or president of a corporation named Donald Trump. And while President Trump did a fantastic job doing what he needed to do, I still feel like there's a lot more that he will have to do when he gets into office in 2024. If, in fact, we the people can stand and face the fraud and start to hold our local officials accountable through affidavits of truth and expose the fraud that they have allowed to happen in the election uh, department in their local counties. And so uh, we're at that precipice right now, John, that if we as a, a country don't uh, own our own responsibility for civic duty that we have not performed, well, you know, we're only going to be the ones responsible when we give it away and uh, slide into communism, which is exactly where we're headed right now. Hmm. Very compelling and, and, and important uh, points, touch points that you make. So there's there's a lot of questions inside of what you just shared to dissect it down a little bit. Uh, the first two questions I'd ask you Anna, on the backs of what you just shared is let's let's back up that statement that you just made, because uh, you had said that to me when we first started talking about your your theory about Trump being a benevolent dictator. What do you mean by that when you say that? Um, simply being that, you know, he's, he himself doesn't see himself as a dictator in the, in the, uh, typical sense of the word, right? He doesn't look at himself like Maduro or Chavez or any of the other dictators around the world, Pol Pot to name a few. No, he's a wonderful human being that, you know, stepped into a role at, to try and save America. And that has been his theme all the, all the while, make America great again, save America, and, uh, you know, he was given four short years to do it. I don't think anybody, including himself, understood the magnitude for which how big the swamp was, just how how devastating this agency government is. Uh, and the fact that you have really two governments governing America right now, you've got the centralized government of 10 square miles known as a legislative democracy in Washington, D.C. That's governed under commerce law, admiralty law, if you will, with rules, codes, statutes, ordinances. Right. And they can mandate. Sort of like if you worked for Walmart and your 
And the corporation of Walmart said, okay, Walmart employees, on Tuesdays, you've got to make sure to wear your little yellow smiley badge instead of on your left side. Please, everybody, put it on your right side. And if you don't do so, you're fired. That's a mandate that comes from corporations. And that's what they did with the masks and the shots, right? They mandated you to, to, to shoot, you know, to wear the mask, to shut up, essentially, to take the shot, to lay down and, 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 and you know, take your death blow. Uh, President Trump did not mandate any of that. Uh, in fact, he made it quite uh, an all, you know, you had a choice. He was all for the right to try. If you remember, he did pass mm -hmm. that executive order. He got that written, the right to try. So he was all about choice. Uh, and I believe he brought forward warp speed to pacify those people who felt like they needed other options. And so he went along with that in order to expedite the reopening of America because our economy is what keeps people's, you know, uh, lights turned on, food on the table, you know, kids in college. And this, you know, our engine is our economy. We need that economy moving. He had his energy independent. So when you're a president of a corporation, you can become a benevolent one or a malevolent one. And he was very benevolent. He did so much to restore the integrity of our manufacturing business in this country, which of course increased corporate tax receipts, uh, which helped, you know, with our debt, et cetera, until COVID. And then of course the printing presses got turned on. And that was, you know, that COVID as we now know was, was in the pipeline a lot longer uh, than President Trump's, you know, tenure in office. It started long before President Trump even was elected. And that has been proven over and over again with patents and, and, and the information that we're now learning through the NIH, et cetera, and the exposure that's coming out. So, um, you know, th this is what I mean. He's a good guy and he was put in the position of doing great things for America. And you, it, like a company with good policies, you can get a company humming along really quickly or you can shut it down really quickly. And what, what did Biden do? He immediately came in and with those executive orders, he deleted everything that President Trump did and put in 60 of his own and has continued to destroy America in expedited fashion, I might impress upon you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the clarification and explanation on that term. Um, the other, again, many questions, we can slice this different ways, but uh, one of the questions I'm curious about, and I imagine some of our audience might be as well, is so they've been, the deep state's been pushing, as you said, basically in your thesis, you know, fear porn for quite some time. That's what had been working up to this point. What do you think, and, and it's, you know, it's, if it's, if it's your speculation, that's fine. Or if you have other details, that's fine as well. But what in your estimation, and as you look at the 30 to 50,000 foot view of this whole thing, what, what do you think is going to be the, the tipping point that's going to get people to say, okay, I'm choosing faith over fear. I'm not going to go the way I am anymore. I have nothing left to lose. What, what do you think that tipping point will be? Well, I think it's really the economy when the financial markets completely collapse, uh, the banks, I should say, collapse, and you are now forced to go on universal basic, basic income, or you're forced as a, you know, CBDC, central bank digital currency, and you're no longer able to Zelle or Venmo or PayPal money out of your account to somebody else. It's restricted. I think that's going to be a real wake up call. I think also if the banks really start to, you know, to collapse. And in fact, I was actually just looking at something this afternoon. I'm going to see if I can find it right now on uh, Jamie Dimon. He's actually now issuing a stark warning. This is in today's Epic Times about the U.S. economy saying that the risks confronting Americans today may well be the worst since World War II while cautioning of downside risks that may dash market expectations for an economic soft landing. This was in his annual letter to his shareholders. And Jamie Dimon, going back a year, started warning about storm clouds on the horizon. And, you know, if you start to look back to March of 23, and then again this year, uh, March of 23, we saw, you know, uh, the uh, some banks collapse, uh, Silicon Valley Bank for one, and, and several others, they were rolled up. And then in March of this year, you basically saw that, you um, the uh, the uh, Federal Reserve said uh, we're no longer going to be shoring up our uh, our banks anymore. So you, you've seen policy changes that are going to have significant impacts on the bank's liquidity. The banks testified in October of 23, Jamie Dimon again, saying that, look, we can't we we used to have 50 percent reserves in our banks. So in other words, if you put in 100 bucks, we could loan out 50. We'd keep 50. Then they went to zero. Right. They were allowed to just go to zero. So now you were seeing uh, the, the Congress in October saying, well, can you get us to 3% reserves? And Jamie Dimon said, no, they don't have the liquidity to have any reserves at this point. So essentially what he's saying is the banks are insolvent. We have, and, and that has not manifested itself because the government has kept printing, 
right? Mm -hmm. They keep printing money. Your taxes are not even required. The government doesn't run on your taxes. None of your tax dollars go to do and to fund anything. Mm -hmm. In fact, it just is really applied towards the interest of the national debt. They just keep printing. So it's, this is all such a, it's such, such a fake ruse on, on everything is built on a house of sand right now. And the sand is shifting and the house is starting to collapse. And so I, I think this is what's going to wake people up when all of a sudden they wake up and realize there's no money in their bank account or their 401ks uh, and their IRAs have been consumed by the banks. Because again, that's a government operation, right? That's a government mm -hmm. uh, privilege to put money away tax-free. Uh, I think when people wake up that their stuff has been taken from them to basically bail in the banks, thanks to Dodd-Frank in 2010, I think that's when people are going to go, oh my God, and they're going to get active. But I, it's horrible to think, John, that we've exposed child trafficking, the child trafficking industry, the organ harvesting, all this stuff. And yet people still, it, you thought the children would get people to wake up and be like, that's it, I'm done. And no, I think it's going to be the wallet, which is how Trump basically managed you know, the United States, right? He kept peace through trade deals and the power of the wallet. And that's uh, and that was quite effective. So I think it's what's going to be effective in this situation as well. Couldn't agree more. And and I'm smiling because it that is such a basis of what we talk about on our show, is that you know whoever's controlling the money controls the power, controls right. the people. And and what we're right. encouraging our audience to do, I'm sure you as well on your end, is become your own central bank, right? Right. Own physical gold and silver. Barter. Um, you know, when this, when the, and again, you know, obviously there's the great reset slash hate reset. And then there's the godly global currency reset that we're focused on, right. For God's giving yeah. people, um, that God is going to use the wealth of the wicked to, to lay it up for the righteous, right. Cause you're seeing all these corporations, you know, Macy's closing, you know, we could, we could talk for days on this, but you know, you know, Macy's closing up 450 stores in the next two years. When would you ever think you would see that? And it's amazing pe people's, to your point, passivity that, oh, well, that's just because we're on an online world. No, 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 no. People still like to go and shop and go to places. They still want to go out to eat. When you're seeing all these restaurants close up, you got the dollar store, 99 cent store going away. You got Dollar General going away. It's hitting, every, I mean, big tech, just to counter that argument, big tech, Google is laying off thousands of people left and right all the time. And it's, it's like you said, the sands are shifting more and more and more. So you know, we sort of have a theory on our program. We call it the uh, the water at the door. So, you know, back in the days when you would watch the Weather Channel, right, and to see what the weather was for the day, and you know, you see it in predictive programming with movies, right? Oh, you know, there's a big storm coming to your town, whatever. And you, the average person, goes, "Oh, well, that's not my backyard, so I don't care," right? They go back to drinking right. their coffee. A couple hours later, they look out the window and they see their neighbor's doors now capsizing. The water is going up to the door. Now they're like, oh boy, maybe I should pay attention. The next step is it's you, you right. know? So, you know, I, I, what we're, what we're working on our program to do, and I'm sure you are as well, is to get people to take decisive action now and not wait until the last minute, because at that point it's already too late. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, and this is why, you know, people, if they're not taking, you know, stock in terms of being prepared for what's coming, there's going to be when the, when the federal emergency management uh, agency FEMA mm -hmm. pays triple the rate to install a ham radio tower in the Midwest back in September of last year. Make sure it had to be up. It had to be up by September so that this ham radio tower can communicate with other ham radio operators around the world and then follow that up with con they're you know looking for amateur ham radio operators in which they can hire to contract because they're expecting mass casualty events by the millions of Americans. When that is you know presented to you, and you look at the invasion happening at the southern border and you see that this is being orchestrated uh, where the federal government clearly is not defending the Constitution. Article 4, Section 4, the federal government, the reason we supposedly pay taxes, right, is so that they will deploy our military and defend our border from enemies coming across. And they're not doing it. And Joe Biden is lying to the people saying, well, give me give me the resources I need. Give you the resources. You've got a military, buddy, and you command it. You're the commander in chief. Or did you forget that yet? Probably. He's a mushroom. But you have that, and then you reflect on the fact that if all else fails, if the federal government collapse, we still have the 10th Amendment, and the states have the ability under Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3 to, to defend their borders, to call a militia, uh, to use the state National Guard, et cetera, et cetera, right? You, you look at that, and the state governors aren't calling for this for the last three years, and then finally Abbott stands up three years later after Operation Burning Edge lit a fire literally under him. 
uh, and just, you know, it focused a lot of big media firepower on what was going on in Texas with these illegal alien developments, the amount of money the developer was funding members of the Texas state legislature, U.S. congressmen from Texas, in addition to Abbott getting $1.4 million from the same developer housing illegal aliens in his own development. Come on. You know, this is the corruption. It goes from top to bottom all the way through. And Americans need to understand they don't have a government that's working for them. They have a government that's working for a corporation, the corporation of the municipality, of the county, of the state, and of the federal government. They're not working for the people. So we have a republic to restore. We have, you know, public service seats that are wide open that can be, you know, filled again. And we're going to have to do what we're talking, what you just mentioned. There's the great reset of the great hate set. What did you call it? The hate, the the hate, hate reset. Yeah. The hate reset. So yeah. there's obviously two resets running in parallel. Which one's right. going to come out on top? Uh, I, I still believe God wins, so I believe yeah. we will win, and I believe that's why gold-backed currencies in 22 states are being, you know, presented in various, you know, forms along the timeline. Florida actually being out in front, believe it or not, mm -hmm. uh, to get their gold back, uh, you know, money stood up here with a depository that they'll share in Texas. Right now, I don't believe they've got plans to put one here, but I know that Texas is their their partner on this. Right. So, you know, I think that there's we we can stand back up our government too, and we can start to govern by the people. And, uh, and eliminate the fraud that's, you know, basically selling us out and allowing these states to be overrun with illegals. I, you know, DeSantis, my own governor, why are you busing people to Martha's Vineyard or flying them around? It's a great political stunt, at least when you were running for president, but it's not now. It's, it's, hurting, our, it's hurting our country because yeah. we're allowing these invaders everywhere. Absolutely. And I'm also glad, Ann, that you brought up uh, Governor Abbott because we just put a video on our Telegram. Uh, I know you're a member on there. You might have seen it uh, recently where uh, President Trump was alongside Abbott with the military. Right. And, you know, typically the military answers to who's the commander in chief. And you okay. notice you see Trump there, but you don't see Biden. And to me, that was a pretty clear and telling sign of, of you know, moves and counter moves, because like you like you said, you know, um, we got we have parallel things going on. People have to remember we have duality. We have parallel presidents. We have parallel economies. We have parallel uh, governments and agencies. Uh, and it's a good segue and to talk about uh, the next step because there's many things you guys can discuss in, in parts as the interviews go along. But uh, then I think a good segue to that is you're seeing the BRICS nations develop and de-dollarizing from the rest of the world and yeah. pulling away from the U.S. hegemony. Right? Um, we had Bill Holter. Uh, who's uh, with Miles Franklin? You've probably seen him on X22, and you know he's a regular guest of ours. And he he, I asked him what is gold and silver's true value. He said it, he said John, it, they're saying it's you know now we're getting a trillion dollars instead of what is it a year or two now it's every ninety to hundred days it's 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 you know speeding up rapidly right because you have the dollar's death of the central bank which only lasts every fifty years is now pretty much we're at the evisceration or overdue point. Right. right. So inside of that, he said the real debt of the U.S. economy is somewhere between 250 and 300 trillion. If we were really showing the books without manipulation, and suppression, which we know they're doing. Right. So he believes based on that to pay off the debt, which they're just going to default. And I'm sure you'll probably have a similar mindset because sure. it's just too large. Yeah. Gold and silver's true value would be somewhere in the 125 to 200 thousand dollar range and silver probably higher because there's a run on it, right? There's it's in manufacturing, we've got the new robotic age, we've got the new AI coming. So all that being set for you and to set the table, um, BRICS, you know, is just getting stronger and stronger every day. We just ran a report today that Vietnam is now uh, making plans to jump into the BRICS. Uh, they've been part of the WTO for about a better part of 20 years. Uh, so we're seeing them jump in, we're seeing Iran make their move, and we'll talk about them in a minute. Um, what do you see as the future for BRICS and how it's going to pave the way for the for the new asset-backed economy? Well, I think they are actually the model, right? Because uh, we don't have an asset backing the fiat U.S. dollar. Well, you know, the petrodollar deal is what gave the dollar credibility and strength after we took it off gold. And uh, you can thank Kissinger for that, <laughs> that evil guy, I think, so long. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think because we have been just so errant in our ways, 
running on a fiat currency with really the full faith and credit of the United States government. That is a joke you can choke on, literally. The full faith and credit of the same government that collaborated with the Wuhan labs to genocide their own population and people around the world. We're responsible for heinous crimes around the world, for you know, for spreading democracy and uh, all of that. It's it's nonsense. You know, every every nation has the right to be sovereign. It's up to the people to determine how they want to be governed. And the people so far are now, you know, up until this point in the last say, you know, five years, hadn't really been too upset. I mean, yeah, there was revolutions from time to time, but I think now the, the the world awakening and this genocide that happened on the world has now got people up in arms because they're seeing the true you know, I, ideology of these demons out of the committee of 300 that, you know, feel like there's far too many of us. They want to reduce the population to a billion or less. And mm -hmm. that would be exterminating six to 7 billion people off the planet. And they're, you know, at this rate with the chemicals they're spraying in the skies, the food, our water, and of course the bioweapon that they injected in five and a half billion arms, they're off to a pretty darn good start. And let's not forget the wars that they keep creating and financing on both sides. So the U.S. dollar has been a fallacy, a farce, and it's just been a magic trick that we've had the benefit of of having, and it's been through strong policies on on you know on, on through some of the presidents, particularly Trump, that was able to you know stave off people completely you know going under uh, and becoming completely bankrupt and extinct in their own right. But now we're witnessing what's happening. Those policies are gone and people are fading out. So BRICS showing that you can you know, collateralize your basket of currencies with your own country's assets, gold being the most commonly, you know, common denominator of assets. But a lot of countries have precious metals or that maybe it's the food production. Ukraine is the breadbasket to the world. Just think what they could do in terms of feeding the world out of out of what they've got in Ukraine. And you can just go down the list of all the different countries that have different assets. And for those that don't, uh, you know, look what what uh, Mille just did. I mean, Argentina clearly is rich with assets, but they decided to you know ditch the peso and go right to the U.S. dollar. Mm -hmm. To me, I thought that was an interesting choice because he didn't want to join BRICS initially, and he is like what I've been espousing. He's eliminating agency government all over the place, and he you know nuked the welfare program, which you know and, and immediately you know got his country right side up. But you know, reconsidering joining BRICS is a smart move on his behalf because it is an asset-backed currency, and I do believe that the United States, the dollar, is going to go away, and it's going to convert to, you know, state sovereignty. We were a union of states prior to 1868, where right. we were like independent nations, just like Europe used to be independent nations until, you know, the EU was formed, and they basically did to Europe what they did to the Americas, which was create the United States under one centralized government which trampled on our 10th Amendment rights. Same thing they did in Europe with the EU. And how's that EU uh, doing right now? The EU is is collapsing its own, you know, under its weight of its own, you know, that EU currency is, is a fraud as well. And so mm -hmm. you're looking at nations opting out of that and saying, I want my sovereignty back. I want my own currency back. And I'll measure it against the productivity and the assets we have in our own country. And we'll use those assets. And gold is a great common denominator. There's a brand new exchange that just popped up in Singapore. It's not yet trading uh, in on the Chicago Board of Options Exchange. It's on the OTC over the counter up in Canada. It's called ABEX, A-B-A-X-X. -X. I highly recommend people look into it. I've been following this for a while right now. And this is a comp uh, an exchange that is going to allow for the, for the exchange of LNGs, uh, battery metals, uh, and other assets to be paid for in gold or transacted through this, you know, exchange to, you know, move what powers Asia, which is liquid natural gas, again, assets. And so we're seeing the move out of the dollar into asset backed currencies because there's value in the asset. There's mm -hmm. no value in a piece of paper, John, and mm -hmm. we're not giving anything but to back that paper. In fact, our treasuries are on fire sale right now. Look at, you know, company uh, countries are dumping them left and right. They don't want any part of it. Saudi's just decoupled from the dollar. So we don't even a petrodollar anymore. What are we? We are, we're a laughing stock right now. So I think, you know, hopefully, um, I hope that we can restore the union. I hope we can restore the Republic. And I hope that states will look at seriously having gold back money and, um, you know, setting, pegging themselves to that. So we have a common denominator and move forward from there with free, free trade throughout the continent of the United States. And then of course, like President Trump did, you can negotiate trade deals with countries, one country to one country. And now you can look and, and barter and, and exchange based on the assets and the value of their currency versus what we have. And I think that makes everything so much. That's the true revaluation. And that's the 
the good set we want, not their, you know, not their bad set. And uh, I, I personally feel like that's where we're headed, but it's going to be extremely difficult to get there because the central banks don't want us to go there. That's for, we bump them right out of business. Yeah, absolutely. But you, you also know that's the only way, you know, Trump is going to be the third president in history to get rid of the central bank next to, you know, Andrew Jackson and almost, you know, risked his life, but it worked out thankfully. And I, I think history will repeat itself. Um, but we, we do have to take, uh, each American has to take action in, in their own respective, you know, homes, communities, and, and galvanize whenever and wherever they can. Uh, so I'm, I'm totally agree with you on, on your, your thesis with that. So with BRICS, let's get a little more granular. What country or countries are you watching in particular to, to rise above? And I agree with you that Putin probably is, he's, you know, because, you know, you have the Donbass and Lugansk areas in Ukraine that are Russian citizens, right? So, you know, Putin has actually helped to build those areas up, build up the war-torn areas, provide, you know, food and medical supplies to a lot of the people there in need. So, you know, he, he I'm sure he, to your point about Ukraine being the breadbasket to the world, like Zimbabwe, right. he's going to take advantage of that. So with all that being said, what country or countries are you primarily watching within the BRICS to kind of break out and, and make a, a seminal difference? Wow. Well, if you just want to do it on a population alone, I mean, India and China, right? They're just behemoths, billions that each have, a, you know, a couple of billion between the two of them. So that is a significant portion of human resources and human capital. That's productivity. Uh, the thing about China is they, you know, they got to import a lot of stuff, particularly uh, when it comes to energy. So I'm going to be look, I'm going to be looking to see what they do specifically. And I think Russia, who has, you know, flipped around, if you compare where Russia is today, uh, and where we are today, we are the Russia of 1917. We're literally under a Bolshevik revolution right now where you've got that, you know, that playbook of communism being shoved down our throats. A totalitarian state has taken over and Americans just aren't waking up to it yet. Uh, they will, though, when the financial crisis hits, they will wake up then and they'll go, wait a minute, something is really wrong here. So from a population perspective and, and you know, countries that are you know, when you look at uh, what we did on Operation Burning Edge with China, right, the Belt and Road Initiative is very significant. And they've reorganized Europe through mass migration to basically leave the, you know, the, the members of the European Parliament impotent to stop the, the Belt and Road Initiative, where all leads, ro you know, roll right into, into uh, Germany, uh, Brussels, and uh, the Netherlands. That's where they're going to create the tri-state city, which is basically the effective world headquarters for the United Nations and the one world government. That'll be their seat right there. But China has basically developed their BRI all over the world. And you can see it particularly down in, you know, South and Central America with, you know, just, just go and visit. You see Chinese owned bodegas and supermarkets and restaurants everywhere. So it is no secret that China is there in full force. They were the first ship to transit the Panama Canal after Jimmy Carter gave the Panama Canal to the Panamanian government. So it's, I think those two countries alone are big. And I also consider, you know, Modi was a, a good friend of President Trump's, right? The pr prime minister of, of India. So I am, I'm, I'm hopeful that there is some reciprocity and some goodwill that can be capitalized once Trump is um, reelected back into the presidency, because I think Americans are going to be fed up and sick of what's happened in this country so far, assuming we can overcome any election fraud. Um, but I also think that uh, Putin is also, you know, not up to taking over the world. He has his hands full with what he's got going on in his country. And if you talk to people like Tara Reid, who was, you know, basically targeted by Joe Biden, you know, as a, an unfortunate assault victim of Joe Biden, she defected to uh, Russia because she was, you know, getting too much grief here. And she re openly reports about how successful and well off the middle class is in Russia. I don't know, John, if you've traveled around the United States recently by car, but I have, and mm -hmm. I fly all over the place. And it is devastating what I see with my own eyes based on the cities, the infrastructure just completely crumbling around us. We are under attack. We've been invaded. Our intelligence community is has been weaponized against us. Our own media has been weaponized under the smith munt Act to just basically percolate whatever the government wants to use to terrorize us with fear porn. And Americans are just now to the point of shell shocked or they just disbelief. And once they get through those two phases of shell shock and disbelief, they're going to get mad. And I just hope that they can get mad in time to stand up and do what they need to do. So again, to answer your question, uh, India, China, 
And of course, uh, Putin being the chairman of BRICS are the three countries I'm paying close attention. And of course, Zimbabwe has already gone gold back. So that's kind of exciting to see their RV already in place. Yeah, and I agree with you. I've, I've had the opportunity, and as you know, I have family in Florida, so I've traveled across country here uh, several times. In fact, I'm making a trip in May. Matter of fact, you should bring that up. And even what I've seen you know, in Florida, which is widely considered to be a pretty conservative state, um, I know you live not too far in that area. Uh, even what I've seen in South Florida has been eye-opening, the, the mm-hmm. depravity and the decay in, in, a, in a widely considered red state. Uh, I expect it here in California, but to see it when I saw it in Florida was, was pretty eye-opening. And, yeah. and I think that's done on purpose to wake the American people up to your point, to, to get to the bigger you know, scope of things. And in as far as China and Russia, absolutely. I mean, you know, the BRICS comprises roughly 90% of the world's population. So they they have a huge say in what happens, you know. Right. As you said, you know, with Modi or right, he has a great relationship with Trump. I think it's, they, you know, I know we know that Trump is still working with those guys behind the scenes, you know, uh, very sort of surreptitiously as he needs to in, in his, his shifting roles, right? But, uh, you know, the Indians, as I've known, their culture, they do a lot of, you know, what they call dowries for their weddings. And it always consists of gold and silver. And uh, right. I think, uh, um, what's the other one? They uh, elf, Well, you know, not the elephant, tusk, but, uh, you know, so, so um, ivory, things like that. They have ivory, a, yeah. a lot Jade. of other re- Jade. Yeah, they have a lot of resources beyond what people have heard from them in the mainstream. Um, so, yeah, no, I think that's a good summation. Uh, I'm glad you brought up Zimbabwe because I was going to touch on them next. Yes, they they have moved their RTGs into the ZIG with a QR code, which I think ties into the new digital economic reality that we're going into. But still think, Ann, we need to watch for them because it's not quite done yet because they haven't removed all their corruption. As you may be aware, they have elections coming up mid-August, and Nelson Chamisa is a Christian. He's the people's president choice presidential choice, just like Trump is here for the whole of America. And I think one of the things he's going to be tasked with is removing the corruption and then finally gold backing all of their, you know, bonds and currencies respectively for it to really take effect. But the fact that we're seeing it this early and the start of it, I think is a pretty promising sign. Um, I also want to ask you about a couple other countries, Iraq, you know, there, we know how many resources they have. We have Eid is ending this week. We've got Sudani coming to the U S uh, you know, we know that the U S hates competition. They don't want them to be free of the U S militias. We've got the Iranian proxies sitting in their installed fake government over there, just like here in America, the countries mm-hmm. copy each other. Right. Um, so wanted to ask you about Iraq, what you see about their future with their, um, reinstatement, cause they've been here before, but it's been obviously a number of years, you know, when Hussein, was running the show. And, you know, of course, our fake news government painted him to be a villain because he wouldn't go along with the central bank system, which is why we went in there and raped and pillaged that country. And now they're finally going to get their chance to break free. But I wanted to ask you about Iraq. I also want to ask you about Vietnam because we have the China-Taiwan conflict. As Trump said, they're next. And we believe on this side of things with our team that that's instrumental because the China-Taiwan with Xi on the Republic side will remove enough, not 100%, but remove enough of communism um, to get them, to get their Vietnamese dong broken free. And to that end, and there was an interesting article that came up today. I just wanted to share with you here really quick there. Um, just bear with me. I'm just pulling it up right now. Sure. Uh, it's pretty significant. The uh, Vietnam sentences real estate tycoon Trong Mai Lan to death in the largest fraud case. So you're starting to see corruption slowly getting broken apart on the backs of what we just discussed. So with that being said, it's setting the table. What is your impressions on Iraq and Vietnam? So, you know, Iraq, unfortunately, has been the victim of of the central bankers, right? The reason that we've always gone into the reason we went into Iraq in the first place was under a pretext of weapons of mass destruction. In fact, it was really about the central bankers wanting to put them into the central banking system. Similar to what we did with, uh, you know, um, when we took out, uh, we came, we saw he died, right? Remember Hillary Clinton? <laughs> so th- this uh, this idea that uh, Iraq has been, um, you know, an adversary to the United States would be accurate in the sense that the United States being represented by Central Bank and its corporation to the American people, it would be erroneous in my humble opinion, because I don't believe that the Iraqis are any more... Um, 
not all of them, but most of them, I believe, to be good people, just like Americans are good people. Iraq right now is undergoing its own metamorphosis. They're actually, you know, teaming up with with uh, some of our more famous state sponsors of terror, like Iran, who are under again another corrupt regime of Kume of of ayatollahs, and again installed by who? Oh, that would be us. So, uh, you know, we have we're seeing countries that are like you just said, Vietnam exposing corruption. We're exposing corruption here, although it's seemingly a little bit more of an arduous process because we have just now fully collapsed into what I believe to be a totalitarian state. And we have a massive in, you know, infrastructure and apparatus that's controlling it. But these countries that have been dealing with that for a long time, uh, that are now getting the opportunity to join and become part of the BRICS countries, which are going to you know, evaluate and revalue their currency based on their asset class. Uh, and you're seeing central banks around the world just gobbled up as much gold as possible. Uh, so just look at things like Iran trading up with Iraq, you know, their trading you know, partnership up by 300 percent, looking at solar power, energy, you know, different ways of, you know, powering their economy exploding in Iraq. Uh, I, I do believe that Iraq in itself is actually going to have another significant RV, not too dissimilar to what happened with Kuwait. Uh, when the when we actually revalued Kuwait, if you own the Kuwaiti dinar, when was that? Back in the nineties, early nineties, yep. Right, and that revaluation that happened. Who? I mean, I didn't know anything about that. I was in my you know twenties or whatever when all that went on. Who knew? But man, I wish I owned it then because yeah. I would be sitting somewhere on a private island right about now, enjoying this and and, and be armchair quarterbacking all that's going on. So if you know, for those people that are sitting on the sidelines and asking, you know, should you be investing in in Iraq and ours and and Zimbabwe Zim if you can still get it, what have you? I would be looking at I would be looking at those opportunities because those are the countries that have been suppressed the most by the central bankers and held down, and they've been abused. They've had wars and nation building and wars and nation building going on in their country at their expense and at the American taxpayer expense and the printing press and the devaluation of the dollar. So anybody sitting on a piles of dollars has also been hurt by this around the world. Um, I, I actually look at these countries as really opportunities and opportunity zones to coin an expression from our own government where you can actually um, make money just on the fact that the country is, is getting itself set free by mm -hmm. being, you know, never being part of the central bank. I think the healthiest thing that ever happened to Russia was getting kicked off the SWIFT system because mm -hmm. it forced them into the position they're in and who's chair of the BRICS? Well, that would be Vladimir Putin. So in a way, they are getting the last laugh. While we think we've kicked them down, while they're down, at least the Federal Reserve did, uh, and the U.S. Treasury, we did it. Uh, we're actually going to get our throats stomped, and it's going to be a little ugly for Americans here. And, and I think, I don't know how protracted it'll be, but um, I, I do think we're going to have to suck it up a little bit, as they say, embrace the suck, while countries like Iraq and Iran and China and Kuwait and Vietnam and other countries that have been artificially suppressed will actually get a rebound because they're now going to be able to be balanced based on what their asset backs are. And, and that's, of course, going to be fundamentally into gold. 100%. Something like, like Putin said, and even Bill Holter said, something real for something real. These countries want it, fair reciprocal trade, right? Even Trump it. said that, you know, right. and uh, it's, it's very much an East-West reset. So well, I agree with you. For those of us in this community who know what's going on and are taking action, take more of those who haven't get in the game because- as you said, it's a golden opportunity, no pun intended, to uh, to be a part of this wealth transfer to, you know, help the poor, the lonely, the sick, the needy, and to protect your families in the process as well and be an acts of service. Right. So yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you on that. So bouncing back real quick to the uh, China-Taiwan, um, obviously you don't have a crystal ball, but from, you know, you have a wide range of, of, of resources and contacts. What in your purview are, are you sort of ascertaining to see with China, Taiwan in terms of time frame of that going off? Well, again, you know, I, I look at everything from the, the, the good guys in government versus the bad guys in government. And every country's got good and bad, right? You've got the CCP and then you have the Chinese people, you have the U.S. government, and you have the American people. Uh, Taiwan is... Um, I'm sorry. You want to know what I think about between if China and Taiwan is going to go into war? I I forgot what your question was. No, so no. I I think it's going to be more of a manufactured conflict. It's going to look of course. that way, but yeah. it's going to appear that way, like you said. But what 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 is the time frame that you might see that happening this year? Oh gosh, you know I don't like to put dates on stuff. Sure. I mean, one thing you can say about war is it's unpredictable, and mm -hmm. uh, it tends to be a lot more than you thought it was going to be. Uh, but if you were to sit here and put a crystal ball and say, I have a crystal ball and it's going to happen third quarter, 
I, I don't think that's, I, I, I think that's actually terrible when people do that because it yeah. creates uncertain, it creates fear around certain dates. I mean, let's just look at the solar eclipse, right? People were panicking. It's the end of the world. It's, you know, something's going to happen. Da, da, da. It was a solar eclipse. It's cool. Uh, I was on a plane at the time flying in a Boeing aircraft of all things flying during the solar mm. eclipse. So really nothing happened to me, but um, and I don't think anything happened to anybody unless they stared at it without the protective glasses. So putting a date on a, on any kind of a conflict, if there's going to be a conflict, I think it's just silly um, because you're just uh, I'm not in charge of that. And I don't you sure. know the conditions are set for a lot of things to happen around the world. Look at the Middle East right now. We've got conditions for war in this country on our own soil, yet we haven't had the spark. What is that spark? When is it going to happen? I don't know. That would be silly of me to even try to comment on that. There's so many things that can create that that condition. So I I, I got to be fair with you and say I, I wouldn't put a date on any of it because we just don't know. Sure. No, I wasn't so much thinking a date per se, but just a, a time frame. I would think it would be plausible that it would happen before Trump steps back in optically as president. I would. Would, Are you thinking so they can declare a national emergency and delay the election, or what is your hypothesis? No, there? I, I think China tie, Taiwan, as we've said in our channel, has because I don't know if you've seen it, has more to do with uh, freeing up Vietnam out of communism to break the Vietnamese dong free. Because I, I think that Xi's republic side is going to help them break that up. Because as you know, Vietnam doesn't have an economic is, issue; they've been top in the GDP for a long time now, almost I think twelve plus years. And uh, they, what they have is a communism problem that has right. kept them down. They have a workforce, they have oil, they have silver, they have Litecoin, they have a lot of stuff. But right. what they have is, is a corruption issue, not unlike the rest of the world. And I think that China, Taiwan will be an instrumental um, movement to help free them up. Okay, that that is the fair assessment. Um, and I, it's funny that you bring this up because uh, friends of ours were actually looking at Vietnam. They said, oh, have you ever thought about moving to Vietnam? I said, mm. not really. And I said, well, you should look at the cost of living over there. And so I actually drilled down on the last couple of days because I was curious and I knew it was a lot less, but I didn't realize how much less, hmm. significantly less. I mean, you know, for those people that like to drink beer, can you imagine picking up a can of beer for eight cents? I mean, hmm. unbelievable. Right here, hmm. you'll pay eight bucks for a beer in the States if you go out to a bar or four bucks or whatever, but still unbelievable. And it's it's, it's quite extraordinary, the cost of living um, and their labor is extremely expensive as well in Vietnam. Housing is extremely expensive. You can look at Airbnbs. Uh, I'm going to be visiting Michael Yan and Masako Ganaha in Japan in the not too near future. And, uh, you know, I said, you know, since I'm going over there, I'd like to go look at Vietnam and a few other places in that part of the world and, and just, you know, see with my own eyes. And I started looking at Airbnbs, 25 bucks a night for a three bedroom with a, with a minivan you can drive. Oh. And it's a nice house with a pool. 25 bucks a night. Think about mm. that. What would you pay for something like that here in the States? That'd be 350 easily a night. Sure. Um, so it's just, it's extraordinary. The economies of scale, which just goes right more into the whole reset story. We we can't have such lopsided economies because for instance, the people that are coming here across our border, I supposedly think they're coming here for a better way of life, free of communism. They don't realize they're going right into the jaws of communism because that's what drug them here through these socialistic policies of moving people um, uh, you know, and giving them false hope and, and false reasons to come here. And they're leaving a four, 40 cent cup of coffee for an $8 cup of coffee and no hope for a job because we've exported the jobs to the country from which they came. So it, it's, it, you know, there is a, there is a uh, fight in the reset going on. And I, I think it's playing out right here in the United States. And you can, you know, juxtapose it to countries like China, to countries like Taiwan and to countries like Vietnam. And look at the difference, and you realize that you know it is that globalist global governance that they're really that they're really seeking, right? This is what mm -hmm. the Committee of Three Hundred, the UN, the World Economic Forum, they're fighting for global governance. And you've got the rest of the countries that have been subservient to their communist ways that are saying, you know, what, that's not the answer. We've seen the writing on the wall. Venezuela is the most recent incantation of that, and yet we still don't see it unless you're a Viet uh, Venezuelan that comes here and says, whoa, 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 you guys are going down the same dark path. It's only a mm -hmm. matter of time. So uh, I, I think, you know, I'm sorry, I know I'm going around in circles no, here, okay. but you, you sparked something in me that is, you know, trying to cycle this whole thing in a, on a bigger, higher footprint so that people can see how it all kind of comes together. There's the global governance model, which includes communism and socialism. And then there's the, you know, the free market economy, which it would include you have to have a stable currency and something of value to trade. You know, they're going to dictate costs and values here and control and people down here don't want that. And what you're saying and what we're talking about is BRICS, while it does include a lot of countries that include, 
you know, hellacious governments, I think that the financial system, again, is going to be the great equalizer that reduces this communist tyranny to rubble. Because if you're going to play in that space, you can't have communism in your country. You just simply can't. Yeah, 100 percent. I'm so glad you brought up a nice counterpoint that sparked me as well as I was listening to you. Uh, because you look at Venezuela, the boulevard, they were the fourth largest economy in the world. Historically, yeah. everything replicates. We can we we know that boulevard is going to be extremely valuable in oil and gold and other things. You remember Trump said, I don't know if you remember uh, when he did a State of the Union five years ago about this, mm-hmm. that was about February. He said that Juan Guaido was going to oust Maduro. And once they get solid leadership in there, that country will come back like that. So uh, Venezuela is when I'm watching the Colombian peso, I think has great potential, right? I mean, all you have all 209 countries and provinces are going to re-up and get, get right-sized, as you said, because it's the only way that these countries can compete in fair trade and commerce, like Trump said in his first term. Uh, right. another, another great country, right? Uh, you've got uh, El Salvador got out of debt now, and they're starting oh, yeah. to move forward. They just did a 0% tax for outgoing countries wanting to do business with them. Great incentive to come in. It's a great way to you know, kickstart an invitational process, right? Right. Um, so last question for today, because I know you're tight on time. Um, one other country we're really watching close, you know, uh, it's been said Israel will be last, um, is watching, you know, Israel has just made a big proclamation, and I'm sure you saw on our Telegram that uh, we put it out there that and others have as well, that uh, Israel is going to, the next time Iran strikes them, and we know this stuff is scripted, right? We understand all that. But they have said and proclamated to the world mainstream media that the next time Iran makes a strike, and we think it'll be somewhere after Eid ends this week, you know, whether it's, you know, a month or three weeks, like you said, you know, nobody knows when war or the threat of war will happen, but we know it's coming, um, that Israel is going to hit the secret nuclear power plants of Iran, which is hugely significant for, I believe, the reinstatement of the dinar, the shakeup of a lot of other nations, and Israel can play a part in freeing up the U.S. factions militarily and the Iranian proxy government in Iraq, which will also free up a lot of the rest of the Middle East, Damascus, um, you know, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Turkey, Palestine, all those nations will get freed up as a result of this cataclysmic event. Just wondering what your thoughts were on Israel's role to play there. Ooh, wow. Okay. So that's a little bit different than what I see. Um, I mean, that's a very hopeful look at what would happen if Israel struck Iran's secret nuclear program Mm -hmm. um, because Iran has been saber rattling that they're going to have, you know, Israel struck Syrian, uh, excuse me, Israel struck the Iranian embassy in Syria. And since then, you know, the Iranians have been saber rattling. They're going to strike back. And I mean, really, they could, uh, you know, first of all, Hezbollah could rain down 100,000 missiles if they wanted to in Israel. They could also uh, collaborate with the Syrians. Syrians could, you know, take uh, a bunch of their military into uh, into uh, southern Palestine down there and, and mobilize with Hamas. I mean, there's so much they could do. Uh, are they going to do it? I don't know. I I, I, I don't know. Uh, but that is th- that has one of those, uh, like I said, war is unpredictable. Mm-hmm. That has, I believe, all the recipes and hallmarks for being something seriously unpredictable and seriously bad. I was actually talking about that with Michael Yan earlier today when I was out on my walk early this morning. And, you know, we both think that that is going to ultimately be the powder keg that kind of kicks things off. Um, But we don't know when, what's going to be the strike, what is it? Because it's just, you're dealing with a lot of unpredictable um, ideologies, ideologies. Mm -hmm. You know, when you, when you have people that will, you know, jihadi themselves with a suicide vest uh, and blow themselves up, I don't think mutually assured destruction is something that is out of their vernacular and out of their in ideology, they don't care if they die. Some of those people just don't care. I don't know that I would put so much hope into a nuclear strike from Israel into Iranian uh, power, uh, nu- secret nuclear power supplies or n- secret nuclear plants, excuse me, um, as something that's hopeful. I-, I don't know because I don't, I only think that's going to have full scale war retaliation. And if Iran is in bricks, it's going to take Putin to try and put the lid on it so it doesn't escalate to mutually assured destruction. Uh, and, and it's going to require Putin to have a heavy hand over there. Can he do that? I hope so, because uh, they're not listening to us. You know, they're certainly not listening to John Kerry. He's a sellout, useful idiot. Right. You right. know, I I don't know. I disagree with you a little bit on that because I just think that's pretty hopeful that 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 would have that sort of a cascade effect. John, from your lips to God's ears, I hope you're right. I really do. I pray that you would be right on that. But that to me just 
I don't know. I'm not, I'm probably not that I'm more skeptical. That's fine. I mean, that's why I asked your opinion. I wanted to get your yeah. take on it. It's, it. This is an open forum to exchange ideas and opinions. And nobody ever agrees 100%. And, and no, to, of course not. And to be that's fair, okay. it is actually my proclam. I just want to give credit where credit is due. It isn't my proclamation. It's actually a gentleman named Matthew Footford on YouTube who had said it about five years ago. Um, wow. It's just our team. When I, we have a, I have a, a blessed team of men and women that, you know, come alongside me to share information. We pray and discern over it, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so we just like giving credit where credit is due. We put it on the uh, telegram you can see back on Monday, but, you know, God showed him years ago that this was going to, when things seem at their worst, which is basically an offshoot of a Kim Clement. I mean, it's an original idea, but, but Kim Clement had said, you know, when things seem at their worst, I'll free my people. So it isn't so much about us wanting to, um, we do want to be hopeful. We do want to be optimistic, obviously, but, uh, but, but something that was prophetically shared that, that uh, has, you know, now that, you know, Israel has come out and said what they've said, it's just very interesting, the timing of it, that they would say it now when all these things are, you know, percolating to a boil. So, right, right. Just an interesting observation. I, I'm actually on your telegram right now. And you had put an article up on, uh, you said disclosure of creditors to Iraq internally and externally. So EID ends on Sunday. Will Abadi and Zarafi, I'm sorry, Zarfi accompany Zarfi. Sudani on the trip to DC on Monday. Right. We'll soon find out what if the father Barzani shows his face over the next five days. Every time he does, war breaks out in the Middle East. What a coincidence if Israel attacks him uh, uh, in Iran while Sudan uh, attacks Iran while Sudan is away. Correct. Um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. You know, it's just it's just an interesting discussion to have because it's yeah. relevant to the totality of what we're watching. So, um, but no, that's that's totally fine. I mean, you know, there's we welcome all different. Uh, objectives and opinions here, and we respect what you bring to the table. So that's why we wanted to have you on. Uh, so with that in mind, Anne, we'll table it for the next uh, discussion, which I look forward to having with you next time. Um, what we always do with our guests, if you're not familiar, is we ask where can people find out about your work and what final thoughts you have for the audience today. Sure. So first of all, thank you, John, for having me on. Uh, final thoughts from me are is, you know, America, we're at a precipice and we actually have all the power. We always have had the power. If you remember, um, Wizard of Oz, when she just tapped her shoes three times and said, I just want to go home, right? Well, we can restore the Constitution in the same way. We can restore the Republic. We have the power because it has always been ours to have and control. The government was to be our trustee of this indentured document known as the Constitution. And, you know, as a friend of mine says, the trust can never fail for lack of a trustee. Well, we don't really have trustees anymore. We have corporate, um, you know, uh, we have corporate tyrannists that are ruling our country. We have corporate overlords known as Congress. And we have the opportunity to restore the Republic through the proper elections of true public servants. And I'm hopeful that people will activate, engage, and will look at their local levels on how they can start to replace their members of their commission, their county commissions, their municipal uh, uh, count, town councils, whatever it is, and get involved locally. Because General Flynn, who is a friend, reminds everybody local action has a national impact, and we can do that. So um, I, I believe that Americans are resilient. I believe that we have the spirit of freedom and independence in our veins coursing through us at all times. Even those that are asleep, uh, when they, as I said, when the wallet has been shut and they don't have access to money and they're being limited their access of monies, that's when the American independence will, will rise again. Um, and folks, if you find that interesting, you can certainly follow me. I'm on Twitter, X, excuse me, formerly known as Twitter, I still can't after how long it's been. I can't get used to it at Ann Vandersteel is where you'll find me on X. Great. Appreciate that. And folks, you heard Ann talk about a minute ago. Uh, she felt that uh, if you have the ability to invest in foreign currencies like the dinar, dongs, and boulevard, and bot, many other currencies, uh, that this would be a good time to do so. And um, if you're interested in purchasing those currencies, there's a lot of great options out there. Uh, we'll just leave that link in the description and you can decide for yourself how you want to proceed. And Vanderstil, thanks for joining us. We look forward to having you again very shortly. And we thank you for your time. Thanks, John. Thanks.